Queen's Gambit, which starts after the first moves of d4, d5, and c4, is one of the most popular openings that uh, exist in the theory of chess. We see it every day in Grandmaster tournaments, in uh, games between uh, chess amateurs, in the internet, in the club. Essentially, it's known as very well, very good, very positional, and solid type of opening. So, I've shown you the English opening, so why am I showing you the Queen's Gambit? I mean, we want to have an easy repertoire, right? Well, my point is to actually show you, right, I'm going to show you a couple of different systems and a couple of different openings that are known as good for the positional players. I've got it on my own experience, and the experience of uh, uh, quite, quite some students, that uh, essentially whenever the Queen's Gambit happens, or whenever the, the, the English opening happens, it works for some players, but others may find some of these kind of systems not fitting well. You see, it's very individual, so you may you may just feel not good about it. So that's why I'd like to give a couple of different type of opening lines and plans, so you can get to try them and find out which ultimately suits your individual needs. That is going to be my point. So let's talk a little bit about the Queen's Gambit, and that could be a good alternative for you to try if you are a positional player or you just want to play more solid. So essentially after c4, black's got the choice to decide whether to accept the gambit pawn and play d takes to c, or as a matter of fact the other thing that you can do is to decline it and simply come up with a move like e6 which is also a, a well, well, known, well known and solid opportunity. But instead of d, d takes to c, it just goes that way. Now let's begin with the accepted gambit because some people don't know why black white is giving away the pawn. The point of that move is that black can never really hold that pawn, which means that after knight f3, knight f6, and then pawn e3, white is definitely going to take back the pawn by capturing with the bishop, and black cannot do much about it. For instance, if black tries b5 in this position, uh, what white can do is come out with the move of a4, and what we see is that if that b pawn falls, that's the, uh, you know, the backup. So essentially, if that pawn falls, then then the a c4 pawn is going to fall very quickly, and and black will lose the pawn ultimately. But that's not the point. The point is that he's going to be having some big weaknesses, like what we see on the c7 and a7. So literally, it's not a good idea. I don't I don't get to like that much. Okay, another thing is that black may try to protect with. Okay, a6 is impossible because that rook on a8 is hanging, so there will be the pin if he does it, you know, so we have 8 xb and then black cannot take back. So I, I think that one of the other opportunities could be c6. Now, if you want to play this opening, you need to know this kind of trap here, that black cannot literally accept the pawn. So after c6, <coughs> 8 x to b, and then c takes to the b, the easiest way white can take the pawn back with b, with b3. The point of the move is that we'll, we'll be quite in a good condition to attack c4, so should black capture in b3, we can have bishop takes b5 and queen takes b3. Ultimately, as a result of all, all, all of this, what we get is that uh, black just lost his pawns. He got into a position with an isolated a7 pawn with quite a few undeveloped pieces and uh, white has also the pawn majority. I mean, what else can you wish for as white out of the opening? So, so that's the reason why black cannot hold the pawn. Now people usually accept the, the gambit not in order to keep the pawn but to rather uh, you know get a quicker development in counter white center. So This is why after e3 black can play e6 and so when white accepts what takes back the pawn black is going to do c5 usually controlling the um, uh, c5 square gives him a chance to challenge a bit in the white center play with a6 and after a4 I think a white has a pretty good position what you need to know about this typical formation and structure is that white is really going for the ability to uh, develop uh, in an easy way like after queen e2 and after c6 to the d for instance this is one of the variations that can happen rook d1 bishop a7 and e takes to the d the isolated pawn really doesn't look so great but on the other hand don't forget that isolated pawn is not always a weakness. I mean, it could be a really good power. For instance, what we find is that this is helping white to control a lot of squares like e5 and e4 and d4. So three out of the four squares in the center, which can really give him the ability to start uh, or to launch an attack on the king side. Like if the knight c3, maybe bishop to the g5, we can even think about transferring, transferring some pieces directly over that area. So this is quite solid. So it's pretty much that's exactly what one wants to do if black accepts the pawn. So black can't keep the pawn, and if he doesn't, he doesn't, then we're going to 
equalize the match here, and we're going to focus our attention on attacking against the Black King side. Now, what happens if Black declines the gambit? So what you should be doing against a move like e6. Now, if black goes for a move like e6 against you, I'll recommend that you just stick to the natural development, knight f3, knight f6. They can go with a Catalan, which I showed as a part of the English opening video. But if you like to play more Queen's Gambit type of positions, you can go with bishop to g5. Now, this is also very solid, as it develops the bishop on an active position, constantly exerting some pressure on the f6. And the uh, couple of next moves that I particularly like are the following. First of all, what you can do is go for knight to c3. Black is going to do short castles, and I can go for a move like e3. So the development is pretty good. We can do rook c1, and we wait. Now you wait until black decides where he's going to go. Now, why don't we develop the bishop on d3? Because we don't do it, because if we do it, black is going to take and win a tempo. See, so. We'll ultimately need to develop that bishop, but what we want to do is to make him play a couple of awkward moves because he can't just lead his development or play c5 or so before he plays uh, c dx to the d, d dx to the c. So we want to develop our rook, play e3, make all the useful moves before we go on to lose that tempo with bishop d3, which will force us to take a second time with that bishop uh, in order to recapture on c4. So after rook c1, black usually plays c6. That kind of gives him this this natural type of pawn chain which looks very solid but it's also passive so you see solid does not always mean good sometimes it's passive and I, I like solid but active like white's position here solid and passive is not my type and I don't recommend any of you to, to have that, that those kind of positions out of the opening so literally what white can play is bishop d3 and so black has to do something otherwise he's uh, in, a, in too much backward position if, if he plays b6 short counts and bishop b7 what I think is that white can just continue to develop and now you may even look for e4 or if black does this then we can prepare our pieces <clears throat> and one of the uh, interesting ways how white can continue with in, within this position is to exchange like maybe we can say c dx to the d e dx to the d we can do uh, knight e5 or we can even exchange making hanging pawns which can be kind of nicely attacked by bishop b5 you see the black knights are the best supporters near the pawns and if we actually get to exchange them like bishop takes f6 and bishop takes d7 he'll be having some some difficulty in protecting those two pawns around the middle so this is it's not it's not that easy so uh, this is literally a, a very powerful way of playing it and okay what happens after bishop to the d3 if black doesn't wait but he takes in c4 with an idea to exchange now this is the main line of the Queen's Gambit declined in the orthodox variation. So what is what White is supposed to do is to exchange once on e7 and castle. Now remember that the whole idea here is to try and take advantage of the pawn majority that you have in the center. And so what can happen is that in order to continue with his development and uh, probably counter, what Black would need is to exchange. And that is quite awkward because what we find is that this knight has made three moves to exchange on c3 while the white knight has only made one move to go there. In addition, he helps our rook to improve itself. So after e5, what we can do is go for a move like uh, even queen to c2, and after e to the d4, e to the d4, again we have an isolated pawn, but don't you worry about that. That isolated pawn is so good. It's cool, controlling, and it can just help you to get your pieces going and right now focus on moves like knight e5 and then rook g3. Now this position is usually considered reasonably equal, although I think it always has this slight chance of getting a better position on the king side because of his much more space and, and good control around the around the center. So it shouldn't be so much of trouble, yet all we have to do is really focus on that idea. How can I get to advance and do something around the black king side? I think it's a very solid opening system good to follow, easy to manage, and uh, it should help you to feel good and uh, get a quite quite comfortable position with white. So that's my what my suggestion is about the Queen's Gambit accepted and declined, and as you can see, if you want something uh, which is more theoretical and, and, and uh, something like the Queen's Gambit, this is definitely for you.